The Christian Hell from the 1st to the 20th Century by Hypatia Bradler Bonner Published in 1913 Chapter 12 Conclusion The doctrine that the condition after death is definitely awarded as compensation or retribution for conduct in this life, or, more shortly, the doctrine of retribution, forms no part of the early beliefs in a future life. Hence, it is claimed as an ethical doctrine belonging to a higher civilization. While it is quite true that the belief in a hell of punishment is found only in what is usually styled a higher civilization, nevertheless, it is in no way an essential part of the higher development of mankind. There are various painful diseases and evil practices unknown to primitive peoples, and found only in a higher civilization. But they are no essential part of it, and civilization has everything to gain by their removal. Similarly, the belief in hell may be looked upon as a morbid growth, a disease, and no true part of the bone and sinew of a healthy and advancing civilization. Because the doctrine is found only in the later stages of the evolution of man, to conclude that it is a necessary or desirable part of it is to ignore the fact that there have been, and are, highly civilized individuals and peoples absolutely devoid of any such belief. To claim it as an ethical doctrine is to cast a slur upon ethics. What effect has this belief in the torments of hell, the most terrific superstition that has ever weighed upon the human mind, had upon the character and conduct of men. Has it made them happier, more moral? Dr. E. B. Tyler, whose splendid services to the history of mankind cannot be overestimated, thinks it plain that the doctrine of future judgment has been made to further goodness and check wickedness according to the shifting rules by which men have divided right from wrong. I have already early in this work referred to Herbert Spencer's opinion that the anticipation of future torments or future joys is necessary to the great mass of men. One hesitates to dissent from such authorities, but is it really true that a belief in hell has furthered goodness and checked wickedness? Is it true that few are wholly fitted to dispense with this belief? Profound erudition or exceptional ability is not required to form an opinion on this point. All that is necessary is a little common sense and some acquaintance with facts of history. Spencer says, The effects of a belief upon conduct must be diminished in proportion as the vividness with which it is realized becomes less. And, assuming that to be so, we may inquire whether the belief in eternal punishment, even when most vividly realized, has ever had much effect upon conduct. It has made good men miserable, but it has never made bad men moral. The golden age of the Christian religion in Europe was the dark age of civilization. Everywhere the lowest standard of morals has been current, where belief in hell has been most vivid. Lecky tells us that the 7th and 8th centuries formed the darkest period of the Dark Age. Every kind of vice was rampant, virtue was rare. Yet this was an eminently religious period. All literature was sacred, and there was little or no heresy. Priests and monks acquired enormous power and wealth. Kings abandoned their thrones for the cloister, and saints appeared by the hundred. If we come down to a period nearly a thousand years later and look close at home, we see the miserably servile condition of the Scotch people and their harshness and moroseness of character under the intimidation of their clergy, who uttered the most appalling threats of future punishment for the most trivial sins. The people believed that in this world they were incessantly pursued by the devil, while in the next the most frightful punishments awaited them. Under this blighting doctrine, men became soured, troubled, and downcast. The fairest and most endearing parts of their nature, being constantly repressed, almost ceased to bear fruit. 
The unsocial, cruel doctrines of their faith destroyed not only human pleasures, but human affections also. They ruthlessly broke domestic ties and encouraged the vilest forms of selfishness by teaching each individual to concentrate his whole attention on the salvation of his soul. It is indeed freely admitted that, when belief in hell was most vividly realized, the conception of a spiritual destiny was made to justify the most ghastly crimes. Man was preordained to do certain acts, and when he did them, he was merely obeying an irresistible decree, and was in no sense amenable to moral censure. This ethical doctrine of retribution, which is the foundation stone of the Christian religion, lighted the fires of the Inquisition, furnished the rack and the torture chamber, and dehumanized men everywhere. For a brief but comprehensive exhibition of the general violence, grossness, cruelty, and license which characterized the ages of faith, the student cannot do better than consult Cotter Morrison's Service of Man. This able and learned writer shows that not in one country nor in one age, but all through the ages of faith, the most flagrant breaches of the moral law are quite compatible with the most fervent and complete belief in God, in the Bible, and in short, in Christianity. Assent to Christian dogmas offers no guarantee for good conduct. There never was a moment from the first teaching of Christianity to the present day when sincere pastors have not deplored the condition of the greater part of their flocks. That the whole world lieth in wickedness is the constant burden of their complaint. Could better proof be required or given that the supposed connection between belief and morals is illusory? So far, indeed, from inculcating ethics, the doctrine of future retribution has been the inspiration of excesses of the most horrible character. Constant dwelling upon the searing descriptions of the awful torments inflicted by a so-called just and loving deity for the most trifling errors blunted human sensitiveness and made men intolerant and brutal, where, moved by reason, they should have been tolerant and kind. Just as there was no proportion between crimes and the punishments ordained for them by Almighty God, so the zealous Christian observed no proportion in his punishments. The anguish of the tortured heretic, the blood of the innocent dissident, massacred singly by the score and by the thousand, will forever cry out and bear witness against the ethics of this man-hating creed. Humaner ideas in the treatment of the sick, in the punishment of the criminal, in the usage of the enemy, in the sufferance of the heretic, have only been growing up with the decline in a realized belief in hell. In isolated cases here and there, it may be that the fear of hell has been, as Burns says, the hangman's whip, which has kept the wretch in order, but it certainly has never moralized mankind. Even in these isolated cases, it is doubtful whether the result has not been due quite as much to the fear of man as to the love of God. The attempt to make men moral by the threat of future punishment is an attempt to intimidate into morality, to coerce by fear. The ethics of mankind should be built upon the rock of reason, not upon the shifting sands of cowardice. The ultimate result of intimidation, whether in politics, religion or social matters, is that the strong, the brave and the reckless will, to a greater or lesser extent, disregard any threats which stand in the way of what they think right or what they desire. It is only the feeble who can be disciplined by the rod in the cupboard, and even they, in their hour of passion, are apt to find a temporary courage which enables them to disregard all risks. Intimidation may also restrain for a time men of low intelligence, but it has no permanent value. Morality bred of fear is a poor sort of thing, liable to break down directly the fear of future punishment is outweighed by present cupidity or any other strong passion. Moreover, what morality could be expected to result from a creed which teaches that belief is everything, conduct nothing? 
which teaches that the virtuous may be in hell and the wicked in heaven, because so long as a sinner repents, even after close upon a century of sin, and is absolved, his salvation is assured, while a life of self-denying virtue will not win heaven without the cross of Christ. Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Nothing is more strenuously insisted upon in the New Testament than the blessings of poverty and the future punishment of the rich. But, save in a very few cases, the fear of hell has never prevented Christians from accumulating wealth. The greatest and most terrific torments of hell are in every religion reserved for the unbeliever. Yet there has never been a period nor a religion without its unbelievers. It is not the fear of tortures beyond the grave which has impeded the tendency to unorthodoxy, but the persecution of man, and even this could only delay, it could not finally prevent divergence from accepted creeds. The uncertainty of the future life, the dread of eternal damnation, the thought of the impending struggle with the devil for the possession of his soul, of the last judgment, of the awful judge, all this has made death itself a fearful thing to the believing Christian. It were a light and easy matter, said Martin Luther, for a Christian to suffer and overcome death if he knew not that it were God's wrath, the same title maketh death bitter to us. But an heathen dieth securely away, he neither seeth nor feeleth that it is God's wrath, but meaneth that it is the end of nature and is natural. The feeling of despairing envy so poignantly expressed by Bunyan when he said, I blessed the condition of the dog and toad because they had no soul to perish under the everlasting weight of hell must have been the experience of countless Christians. Compared with this, the state of the dying unbeliever is happy indeed. To him, death brings no such bitter fear, no such shrinking horror. The future holds for him neither a barbaric heaven nor a monstrous hell. He neither hopes nor fears. Life may be quitted with sorrow and passionate regret, but the portals of death are open for him upon a deep and dreamless sleep. This little life is all we must endure. The grave's most holy peace is ever sure. We fall asleep and never wake again. Nothing is of us but the mouldering flesh, whose elements dissolve and merge afresh in earth, air, water, plants, and other men. As we look at pictures such as those reproduced in these pages and read the terrible language used by representative Christian teachers during 19 centuries of Christianity in consigning innocent sinners to eternal torments and study the awful descriptions of these torments, we may get some idea of the disastrous effect this teaching must have had upon the people who really believed in it. We may wonder that they did not all go mad with fear. There must surely always have been a leaven of doubt, otherwise men could not have preserved their sanity. It is this leaven of doubt which up to a hundred years ago was so small and so weak, and which in some minds today is still so small and weak, that we need to see grow and strengthen until it entirely expels this corroding superstition, this immoral doctrine of eternal torment. Among educated Christians, this leaven of doubt has already taken firm root, both in the minds of the sheep who are gathered into the ecclesiastical fold and in the minds of the shepherds who herd the flock. Among educated Christians, and Protestant Christians at least, the best minds are ashamed of hell today. They profess to accept the teaching of Jesus, but they must put their own interpretation upon what he is supposed to have said. By the aid of their new interpretations, they have constructed a new hell, which has nothing in common with the old except the name. It took the church ten centuries to reject a hell of torment for unbaptized infants and construct a painless limbus for them. And it has taken nearly another ten centuries to reject a hell of torment for adults and construct for them a limbus free from physical pain. There is no doubt that the more enlightened and far-sighted among the clergy would be glad to dispense altogether with this immoral dogma of hell. 
There must be many today who realise the truth of what F. W. Newman said 50 years ago that the weight of hell will totally sink Christianity if it is not cut away. But they are faced with the difficulty that heaven and hell stand or fall together. If you cut away hell, heaven goes also. In the recent symposium referred to in a previous chapter, it was generally agreed that the belief in hell rests upon precisely the same ground as belief in heaven. If you reject the one, you cannot retain the other. Without heaven and hell, without the promise of salvation and the threat of damnation, the occupation of the priesthood would be gone. Hence even the enlightened clergy cling desperately to the husks of hell, while they strive to divest it of all its ancient terrors. One result of all this has been a serious development of the most barefaced, if unconscious, hypocrisy. Although educated Protestants no longer believe in hell themselves and are ashamed of it, they are not ashamed to force it on the schools to be taught to little children. They are not ashamed to teach it to primitive people. A magistrate upon the bench is not ashamed to ask a child too young to be sworn whether he knows where he will go if he tells a lie. How can the clergy justify this teaching to the credulous and immature of ideas which they themselves stigmatize as grotesque? The Foreign Bible Society boasts that it issues the Bible in hundreds of translations and sends it even to the rude hill tribes of India. The Church Missionary Society asks for £100,000 to propagate the faith. The Gospel Tract Societies issue tracts with lurid details such as Straight to Hell everlasting destruction, and are you afraid to die? By what right of honour and good faith do all these persons continue their maleficent work of corrupting the minds of little children and trustful people with horrible ideas which the more enlightened Christians at home reject and repudiate? Protestants may no longer believe in the reality of eternal punishment, but many millions of pounds are sent every year from this country, from the United States, from Canada and from Australia, to carry the fear of hell to the heathen, despite the testimony of missionary after missionary that it is a hindrance rather than a help to conversion, that the educated natives of India refuse to believe in the dogma of unending suffering, that the thought that their ancestors would be burning in hell is for these poor Santhals a terrible incubus, that the Chinese delight to use it to discomfort the Christian missionaries. Among Catholics, money is not only wasted on missions, but it is also squandered on vain masses for the dead, and a Catholic German economist, Dr. Hans Rost, in discussing the relative backwardness of Catholic communities, comments upon the enormous sums devoted by Catholics to masses for the dead, while Protestants set up educational or economic institutions for the benefits of the living. Money is poured forth to procure for the unconscious dead some surcease of purely imaginary pain, while for lack of it the conscious living goes starving and in rags. Tis a mad world, my masters. Education is slowly doing its work in Great Britain, despite the fact that the doctrine of rewards and punishments is still taught to the little ones in the schools. But Christianity extends beyond the British Isles, and our education leaves much to be desired. The fear of hell has behind it the influence of a great and wealthy church, whose whole interest lies in maintaining the superstition from which it derives its wealth and power and must not be lightly dismissed as a relic of barbarism with which the enlightened present has no concern. The struggle for religious liberty and intellectual freedom is a long one. Its beginnings are lost in the unwritten records of the martyrdom of obscure men and women who ventured to rely upon their reason rather than put their faith in the dogmas coined by priests. Much has been gained, but the crowning victory is still to win a victory which can only come with the recognition that the happiness of mankind is founded upon what a man does, not upon what he believes, that contrary to all Christian teaching, conduct is everything, belief nothing. And that's the end of the book. Thank you for watching.